Well, good morning. I'm doing a little experiment with my new camera here in uh, the beautiful little park and preferred RV resort. And uh, one of the things I kind of wanted to test, I've got the camera set up in the corner here and it sees, it's seeing me sitting on the bench. I have the wireless microphone. And here's one of the remarkable things that this camera will do. Check this out. It's gonna follow me over to here. It may not see me as well, but the camera follows me and the audio should be crystal clear because it's coming through the, the remote. So really, no matter where I go, the camera's smart enough to follow me along. I've got my own private little cameraman and it's gonna follow me all the way back here, nice and smoothly. And um, you're probably tired of hearing me say this, but I am in absolute love with this camera. I think it's wonderful. Um, you know, I was just bored one night and I'm looking through YouTube videos and I kept seeing review after review with sort of enthusiastic titles about the DJ, DJI Osmo Pocket 3 camera. And one reason it attracted my attention, and I, I've had two versions of these DJI wireless microphones, and they've been really indispensable with my um, YouTube work, especially doing interviews with people. I have two of them, I can wear one, um, I can clip one to the other person, they're totally wireless and they, they have superb sound. And uh, so the same manufacturer is doing cameras and you might know DJI as the manufacturer that I think they're the number one manufacturers of drones. I'm not into drones. Uh, I thought they were really cool in the beginning when I first, the first couple of YouTubers where I saw with these huge panoramic overhead shots. Now those shots are a dime a dozen. But I, I don't have an interest in that. I do have, um, it's not a drone, it's called a flying selfie stick or flying camera. Um, because the range of it is just a couple of, a few feet away from you. It's um, a very lightweight sort of thing with propellers on it, just like a drone, and it will follow you and take 2K resolution video of you, and it processes audio and takes the sound of the drone out. It's really cool. You've probably seen some of my videos where I use that little flying selfie stick. It's a really cool tool. So I have this now, I have that, um, and it's called the Hover X1, the, the flying selfie stick. So I've got the Hover X1, this uh, DJI Osmo Pocket 3 that, you're, that I'm using right now, and then I have a GoPro 10. And, I, you know, I, I bought the 10, the 12 was out, I bought the 10 because I saved a lot of money doing it. And still, I, I've looked at comparisons between the 10 and the 12, and uh, there's just not enough advantages to it to make any kind of a change in upgrade. So I'm very happy with the GoPro 10. Um, and I use my iPhone 15 Pro Max. And so I've got quite the arsenal of, <laughs> equipment, quite an investment in it when you add all those up. None of them individually was all that much money, except for the, the iPhone is the by far the most expensive piece of equipment that I have. And it, it's almost kind of funny for such a small little YouTube channel, but it, it's a wonderful hobby, which, which I enjoy um, quite a bit. A couple of ways I spend time that I, I really enjoy. I enjoy making these videos. You can tell I love talking and um, I'm a semi-retired uh, mental health counselor. So after I retired, I signed up for um, online services where I could continue to provide um, counseling services to those people living in Virginia. It's legal as long, you know, it's in compliance with my Virginia counseling license. As long as the person is physically in the state of Virginia, it doesn't matter where I am, as long as my patient is in Virginia, I'm regulated by the state of Virginia. And um, so that's pretty neat. I, could, can, I can see clients a few times a week up to, I've got some guidelines for the most maximum amount of money I can, I, I can make for my retirement because I took early social security. So I, I can't go crazy. I can't do it full time or I'll have to start giving money back to social security. But um, 
between Social Security and um, the little bit of counseling that I do, I, it, it's very comfortable for me living on the road. Uh, today's a wonderful day because I think my good friends Dave and Regina will be arriving today, but I don't know that because they are in Kingman, Arizona right now, just a couple of two or three hours away, but they're having work done on their Class A. They had some problems with brakes and overheating, and so they're getting new brakes and a new water pump, and they were thinking it's possible that that work could be finished in time today for them to, to maybe arrive here this afternoon. We don't know yet. They'll, Dave will, will give me a call or send me a text because it's possible they won't be able to finish today. They don't work on Sundays, so we'd have to move everything out to Monday, which is fine. I'm retired. I've got time, but I, I, I can't wait to see them today. And they're, they've been good friends of mine. David, for um, it'll be this summer, David and I have been friends for 30 years, and Regina came along uh, as a friend of both of ours about a year later, and um, their friendship took a turn for the romantic, and they became a couple, and they got married shortly afterwards, and they've been happily married ever since. Been retired a little bit longer than I, um, and uh, they have a beautiful home that they've remodeled and done amazing things to in um, outside of um, Dallas, Texas. And um, both times I've gone cross country, I've stopped and, and uh, spent time with them. And uh, I kept bugging them, you gotta get an RV, you guys gotta get an RV. And they did, they ended up buying a, <clears throat> I think it's a 37 foot um, class A RV, which when they get here, I'm gonna show it to you. I'm gonna have them give you a tour and we'll find out really how they're feeling about RV life. I think it was a little rocky in the beginning. Um, I haven't gotten quite a read on exactly how they feel about it now. Um, I'm hoping that they love it the way I love it. Um, but we'll see. I'm going to do at least one or two videos with them. And I think I mentioned it in a prior video that um, I'm going to be willing to let David and Regina tell the most embarrassing Rob stories that they can recall. So you can be entertained and I can be embarrassed. That's pretty funny, isn't it? It will be pretty funny. Still embarrassing for me, but it'll be funny for you. We participated in some hijinks over the years, especially the early years when we were all three of us were younger. Um, what else is going on today? Um, not much. We got up early, took Dottie for a walk, tested it. I bought a polarized lens for um, that snaps on the front of this and try to walk with Dottie with the kind of sun in the lens to see that how that um, if I could do usable video in direct sunlight and that can resolve the kinds of issues you have with excessive light in the lens and so you've probably already seen that video I'll tell you that the atmosphere here in this little place with the I'm, I'm hoping you can hear the the water in the background it's just a beautiful place to sit and relax and I think an ideal place to, to shoot a video and, and chat for a little while. I was talking about, I got distracted, I do that when I talk, about how I spend my time. I spend my time doing these videos and I said in part time I do counseling and that's very rewarding for me to do counseling because it's so much fun. I have such a good time. Um, when I was in my mid-40s working, I was an executive with Dell, and I was making a lot of money in a very comfortable job, and I was treated very kindly by everyone um, that worked for me. I was treated kindly by people that I worked for and worked alongside, but I was, it wasn't meaningful work for me. And I, I made the big decision to walk away from that and go back to school and become a counselor because I'd been in counseling a couple of times in my life and really enjoyed being a patient, being a client, and thought to myself often, what a great job this counselor has that they get paid to sit down with someone and talk about things that are um, um, meaningful, deep, 
emotional, often philosophical. Um, it, you get paid to have meaningful conversations and you, your attention and intent can help people get through rough times. And I, I said, that, I don't care really how much that pays. And believe me, at first, be, when I was getting my degree, I decided I'm going to make the jump. I'm going to start with a job that doesn't require a degree, but is within the area. I just want to start accumulating experience right away. So I left Dell. I went to work for a nonprofit that, um, where I was doing work with kids in foster care. It wasn't a licensed counselor thing, but it was um, like I was doing, um, my title was job coach. So I would help kids find jobs and how to behave in the workplace, how to interview for a job, stuff like that. So I worked quite a bit with kids for a couple of years for a small fraction of the money I was making at Dell. But it was meaningful work. I loved what I was doing. And one thing that I did find when I got my degree and got fully licensed, it took going, I worked and went to school full time and it was two years full time um, including the summers all year round for two years to get a master's degree. And then you need on top of that 3,000 hours of experience that is documented before you can get fully licensed. And the quickest you can possibly do that is two years. I guess it's physically possible to get 3,000 hours in less than two years, but the licensing board says, no, you can get 4,000 hours, but you got to wait two years. It's got to be in two years. You can't rush it. So that's four years before I could become fully licensed and able to do my dream of doing a private practice. So that's exactly what I did. I opened a private practice um, while working full time. I wanted to transition into um, a private practice, so I found an inexpensive office. I was in Austin at the time. I found some office space, and I do, did a couple evenings a week on Saturdays, and um, it was really satisfying. Um, I wasn't ready to pull the trigger yet, and a few years later, I'm skipping a lot of stuff that happened. I went full-time into private practice and discovered something. I didn't like doing it 40 hours a week. As much as I enjoyed having these deep conversations with people, it was draining me of energy. If I was seeing five or six people a day, and that's about the most you can do, that only sounds like five or six hours of work, but it's more than that. You have to do documentation, you have to deal with the insurance companies, and but even five hours of face-to-face -face time in a day with people with, um, you know, you're having fairly intense emotional conversations is absolutely, for me, exhausting. And I realized this isn't sustainable for me. As much as I enjoy it, it's taking too much out of me. So what I discovered to my utter joy was emergency mental health work. And that's um, where I eventually landed doing work for, um, you know, most populous county in Northern Virginia, Fairfax County. I worked for the Fairfax County Community Services Board. Um, I worked in emergency services, a, a uh, clinic that people can walk into or the police could bring people in crisis into. EMS brought people there. And as part of that, I was also part of what they called the mobile crisis unit, where we would go out in pairs and we would um, go out into the community and people in crisis and community, we would go to them. Either by them calling us or someone, a family member, a concerned neighbor, concerned citizen would call and say, hey, I think this person's having a mental health crisis. So it really became a great alternative to people maybe calling the police to go out and do mental health evaluations to um, having licensed professional counselors. I worked alongside with and uh, eventually um, paramedics were brought into it too. It was called a co-responder program that I got involved in uh, where my partner was a paramedic. So we would go out and we would have sort of the medical piece and the mental health piece 
together to try to help people out in the community. And that was, I loved every minute of that. And I was so lucky to find this wonderful job. And after five short years, I was vested in the pension for the county. So that enabled, that gave me really the confidence to retire early because I, I retired at 62. Now granted that pension, I'm not eligible to that until 65 and that's not until next year. But knowing that was coming down the road. And I also back in my years working with Neiman Marcus, I was vested in to a, a, a pension, a small pension there that I'm not eligible till in 65. So when I turn 65 in February of next year, a couple of big things happen with me. I start collecting those two small pensions, which together are a moderate size pension. Plus I'm on Medicare and instead of having to rely on the, the high deductible medical insurance that I have now, where most of the stuff I do like chiropractors and physical therapy and stuff like that uh, and uh, getting medications for um, uh, type 2 diabetes and um, for uh, hypertension, all are out of pocket. You go towards my deductible, but the deductible is $8,000 a year. So I have no prayer of reaching that unless I have some kind of disaster. But with um, Medicare, with the supplement plan, which I'm planning to get, those, those, uh, those expenses will be in the rear view mirror. So I have a lot to look forward to next year when I turn 65. Um, so as, as many drawbacks as there are to the, um, the art of aging, <laughs> you feel it when, trust me, when you get here, you feel it when you get up in the morning, but you only feel it for a little while. It's a little rough getting out of bed. You're a little stiff and sore, but you move around a little bit. And like now, I've been out of bed for a few hours. It's Saturday, and I don't, right now, sitting on this bench, I don't feel a single ache or pain. I feel just, I feel really wonderful. So, um, but you can't deny that there are um, physical signs of aging that are sometimes a little challenging. But part of the benefits are you start maybe collecting Social Security, you start collecting a little pension like me, if you're lucky enough for that, I'm very fortunate and grateful. And um, having, you know, good insurance at a, at a really reasonable cost. Um, or, and having a lifetime pass to the national parks, I can get in the national parks for free, and the camping's half price. I got that at 62. It's the first act on my 62nd birthday was to go online and purchase one of those national park lifetime cards, and they're also good in Army Corps of Engineer campgrounds that'll get you uh, half price, and most of those campgrounds um, have um, electrical and water hookups. Not many of them have sewer, but electrical and water. And the one, I was a camp host in one for a summer, a couple of summers ago. And I think the, the retail price was 22. So if you had a, um, a card, you were getting a, for $11 a night. Well, and actually, you know what? <laughs> they didn't have electric there. I had electric and sewer. I had full hookups because I was a camp host. It was dry camping, I'm sorry. But there are Army Corps of Engineers campgrounds that do have some electric and, um, and water. And I don't know what the rates are. So I thought I knew what I was talking about. You know, what I was thinking about, what I was thinking about was um, the New Mexico State Parks, which this will be the second summer I'm going to New Mexico. And uh, with a non-resident annual camping pass, which it cost me $225, um, the um, water and electric which is available in if you get a reservation that is available in uh, almost all the state parks is um, four dollars a night so it's four dollars a night your reservation i believe costs a reservation fee of twelve dollars for two weeks that's the maximum amount you can stay in a, a new mexico state park so so it costs me 68 dollars for two weeks and um, let's call four weeks a month, and really isn't, there's an extra day, or there are a couple of extra days there because that's only 28 days. But let, let's call, let, let's just divide that by 14. With the reservation fee is $48.86 a day times 30 days, 
we're talking $145.71 on average for 30 days with electric and sewer in a beautiful park. They're beautiful parks all over New Mexico. So my rent, including utilities, in the summers, $145.71. There was a big scare this year because the Parks Department came out with a proposal that said, um, we haven't been able to raise rates in like 20 years. We need to completely redo this system. And what we're proposing is we're going to get rid of this annual pass thing. It's killing us. So no more annual passes, and we're going to substantially hike up the amount of money that you pay to stay overnight, especially with the hookups. And it was going to wipe those savings out. And um, they were proposing that that go into effect, I think, April 1st. They had all kinds of hearings on it, and we were all on the edge of our seats waiting for it to happen. And um, it, the, they put on the brakes at the last minute. We don't know what's happening. We know it hasn't changed. We're pretty confident if you have an existing, um, if you're able to buy a pass, it's going to be good for the duration of the pass, even if they change the law. Now, that's a little tricky for me. My reservations I have, once you make reservations with a card, um, with pass, you're good. But um, I have reservations for a month starting, I think, June 11th or 12th, which brings me through the middle of July. And I believe that's about when mine expires. So hopefully nothing will happen between then and now. So when my mine expires, I can buy another one. I can buy myself uh, at least maybe another summer at these rates in New Mexico. But who knows how these things are going to play out? We don't know. But boy, I got off the track talking about the stuff I spend my time doing. So right now, the life for me is, um, and this can, one of the great things about this lifestyle is this can change at any time. But one of the wonderful things is I've developed kind of a routine. Quartzsite, Arizona, boondocking. In boondocking, if you don't, don't know what I mean by that, is I, I uh, sat in the desert and designated um, federal lands. In, uh, it's called the Long-Term Visitor Area. There are four of them in Quartzsite, Arizona. And you pay $180 for the season. And the season goes, um, I think, September 15th through April 15th. For me, my season is about um, November 15th through about March 15th. Um, so for that whole time, I pay $180, and that, in, that includes a place to dump my waste tanks and to do my trash, and if I want water, there's water available. But no hookups or anything, so I'm responsible for my own electricity. And that's not a problem. It doesn't get hot, for uh, hot enough to even think about air conditioning. The thing you're most concerned about is heating because it gets cold at night during most of the season. So I have propane that I heat with and I have a big 600 amp hour. That doesn't mean anything to you. That's a lot. 600 amp hours is a huge battery bank with lithium batteries and I have over a thousand watts of solar. So I'm able to just turn on the lights, the TV, my internet, my Starlink, anything I want to do, just like I was hooked up to electric, but it doesn't cost me a cent because I'm getting it from, the energy's coming from the sun, and that's how I spend my winters, and I camp with friends, and there are all sorts of activities and things, and, and I made a commitment last year on my YouTube channel to do a video every single day I was in Quartzsite, and I lived up to that with one or two exceptions, but I pretty much did a video a day and that really grew my channel and um, I'm going to do that again probably this year. And like I said, one of the great things about this lifestyle is I can change my mind. I can go to Florida next winter if I want to, but I'm probably going to be in Quartzsite. So, um, and the plan is to spend in my, this is my home area here in Pahrump and Preferred RV Resort, is to spend when it gets, starts getting warm, in the spring in Quartzsite is to come up here to Pahrump. I came up here, oh, the middle of March, and I'll stay until June. And then I'll be June, July, August, and maybe a little of September. Then I'll come back to 
for September and October and part of November and go back down to Quartzsite. So it's Quartzsite, Arizona in the desert and Pahrump on the shoulder seasons and New Mexico in the summer. And any of those things can change at any time. But probably the most expensive part for me is when I'm here. And as I remember, a member of Preferred RV Resort, I pay $16.75 a day, excuse me, $15.75 a day times a 30-day month. We are $472.50, and that is the most expensive monthly rent, and that includes electric and everything, $472.50 for um, here. I'm here basically March, April, May, half months there, so three months. So um, that'll cost me for the spring, for the, so is four, let's see, 72 times three, about $1,400. And actually, that's a little bit, I, when I looked at the dates, the date I got here and the date I'm leaving in June, it more came out to around $1,200. So if I come back and I stay here September and October, that's two months. So that'll cost me about $944. And the $1,200 for the spring. So I'm giving up, plus I have a $325 annual maintenance fee. And then I, uh, for 35 days, so that's basically $2,500. $2, but every year, a discount of $270 35 days every year, it only costs me $675 instead of the $1575. So that's a $270 credit. So we take the $2,500 minus $275. Grand total, $2,500 minus $275 equals $2,200. So a little over $2,200 it costs me to have two pretty long stays in the, the late summer, er, uh, early spring here in Pahrump. And, you know, $2,200. And then we, we take the um, $180 for the season in the winter. We're up to $2,405. So let's call that $2,400. Then I have um, June, July, August. So three months at about $140 a month, plus the annual is $645. I have to do that all over again. <laughs> so it's $2,500 plus the $645, and um, I'm gonna have to edit this part out because I have to rethink this again. So I have July and August, three months at 140. So 420 plus 180, plus 2500 is $3,100 for my rent, utilities, everything for the entire year. Divide by that by 12, $258 a month is what it costs me to do this. Now, that's not including fuel to pull my trailer around, but when I come to Quartzsite, I'm parking that trailer from the middle of November to March, I'm not moving it. I, even to empty my tanks, I have a tote that's 36 gallons that I put in the back of my pickup truck. I fill it with the wastewater and drive it to the, the dump station. So I'm not getting that low mileage pulling the trailer around it all in the winter. When I'm here in Pahrump, I don't move it. Um, the most movement and the highest expense is moving every two weeks in New Mexico, but it's not really a significant thing. So you can imagine, um, think about if you're living at home in a sticks and bricks, even if you own your home outright and you don't have a mortgage, you're likely paying more than $258 a month in property taxes, much less utilities. It's a very affordable lifestyle if you really put your mind to what you're doing. And I, I've really found a lot of enjoyment out of the self-sufficiency of this and um, the low cost and the sense of community. Now, um, 
I belong to more than one community. There's kind of the community in Quartzsite, which is probably the one that I'm the most involved in because I'm there the longest with people the longest. And those relationships go into other areas. There are friends that I've spent time with here in Pahrump where I met them in Quartzsite. And certainly in New Mexico, there, I have friends that are there right now moving from park to park. So I'll be running into them and those are Quartzsite friends. So I'll be running into people in New Mexico this summer that I've established relationships with um, in Quartzsite. And they're friends like Dave and Regina that I'll be seeing hopefully this weekend. And I'm checking to make sure, did I get it? I haven't gotten a message yet from them. So that's good news. The good news is if they got word that, hey, we're not going to be done today, they, they'd, they'd contact me so I can change the reservations. So it, I, my best guess is I'm going to get a text that says we're on our way. We'll be there in X number of amount of time. I'd say it's about three and a half hours. Um, you know, driving slowly, which I hope that they do from Kingman to Pahrump. And today's a good day to do it, to go through maybe, it won't be bad if, as if they hit Las Vegas traffic um, during the week. But anywhere, I hope you enjoyed this, um, this talk in this wonderful environment. And I just wanna show off how this camera follows me and how you see this, you can see this beautiful place and there is some giant koi down here, and I say the koi that I'm looking at is probably this long. They're huge. Um, and I, I'll tell you what, on the way out, I'll pick up the camera and I'll show you the koi. Um, I will say to you, thanks so much for listening to me. Rap, prattle on about God knows what. And uh, I'll end the video with the koi. Here we go. I think I finally figured out how to get some shots of the koi here. I've been still learning this camera, but this is the koi. And they see me and I, they get fed often, so I think that they're looking for food from me.